Okay, thanks for having me here. Um, I am a bit overwhelmed. This is my first conference talk ever. I don't think I knew what I was signing up for. It's like, it was supposed to be a cute new Rails conference and not like this display. It is also overwhelming because the people that implemented this functionality are speakers at the conference, Eileen Wichitel and Adam Patterson. Uh, but they say go big or go home, so that's what I'm doing. Um, I also underestimated how long does it take to prepare a talk like this and how stressful it can be. You know, you think like it's going to be a copy and paste and, you know, I'm going to talk about something that I already know, but no one tells you about Keynote and all the animations it has. So, and then you have to pick one or use them all. So let's start. Uh, this is a uh, fun fact. Um, this is my second time in Amsterdam. The first time I came for my first Ruby conference in 2012, which was Euruco. So like 10 years later, like more than 10, I'm back and speaking at a conference. Uh, my name is Julia Lopez. I am from Barcelona, been doing Rails since 2011. This is not a competition. I feel, I feel like people are here like, oh, Rails 0.3, right? no. Okay, uh, what I like doing, what I thrive doing is like refactoring and upgrades. I, if I, if every time there is a chance to do a Rails upgrade or like any kind of refactor, I'm down for that. My dream would be having a gem file with no pinned versions that you can bundle update every day. It's like a YouTube, like it's, it's the dream. It's not happening. And someone at my company called me the queen of YOLO, as in something good, you know? Um, so that's what I do. And I would like to keep talking, but I have half an hour, so. And I talk a lot. <laughs> I work for Harvest. Harvest is the time tracking tool. Harvest has been uh, in Rails since the very beginning, as uh, 2006. I was just a baby in 2006. Uh, I joined 2016. Um, and does anybody know Harvest, apart from my colleague over here? Does, any, does anybody use Harvest? Wow, good. So, you know, we are like Rails and like Harvest, we have a few different apps, but like the, we have a monolith, which is Harvest app. We have a small engineering team, uh, 13 developers at the moment, uh, plus uh, our site reliability engineers. And uh, I just want to thank my colleagues because they were the first one listening to this talk and they helped me a lot. They gave me a lot of feedback. So what can you expect from this talk? Um, this is not a walkthrough of the Rails guides, which by the way, they are very good. Um, I feel like I find that real experiences are the best way of like learning something. It's more informative and hopefully entertaining. Like if I, you know, like, and also, I hope that you can relate to some of the things that I'm saying. Uh, it's going to be a high level overview on when multiple, having a multiple database set up could make sense for you. I'm not an expert, so bear with me. A quick intro to the feature and show how we use it at Harvest. So it's going to be very specific on like the things that I'm going to focus on is like what we did. This was implemented three years ago with the release of, well, we are not released like upgrading Rails at the time it's like it's released, but Rails, uh, it was around 2020. So I had to go back to all the pull requests that I opened uh, three years ago, pre-pandemic almost. Um, so if there's something that you think it could be improved, just let me know later, just do some code review. So I hope you learn something. So let's start. First, I would like to know if somebody knows about this feature already. And yeah, <laughs> my colleague. Uh, and somebody using it actively? Okay, okay, oh, good, uh, cool. So what is multiple databases? Uh, m multiple is m m many of one, you know, like we know that one. Let's dive about the concept. And it's this slide actually. So multiple is many of a kind, and, but when we talk about databases, databases can mean many, many, many things. I, I can, like, we are going to focus on databases active record can connect to, and active record is like an object relational mapping tool. So it's like a relational database. 
And we are going to refer, when I'm talking about databases, it's not like many schemas on the same database. I'm talking about database servers, because that's like the use case for Harvest. We don't have one MySQL with many schemas. We have many MySQL processes, and each one has one schema. So I wanted to use all the tools Keynotes was giving me, and then I wanted to put a quote, so I went to Wikipedia, because I think it's cool when people put quotes on them. So Wikipedia says that a database server is a server which uses a database application that provides database services to other computer programs as defined by the client server model. I should have asked ChatGPT, maybe, uh, but hopefully everybody knows what's MySQL. You know, let's think about MySQL, Postgres. There is a new hype about SQL, SQL, SQL Lite. I don't know. I don't even know how to pronounce it. Not that. Just MySQL. Okay. Let's keep it focused. Uh, so when does it make sense? Uh, in which circumstances you will have to take this approach? So now it's when I'm going to throw all the buzzwords that we like to hear at conferences. High availability. So high availability, what does it mean? It's also known as the ability of a system to remain operational and accessible for users with minimal downtime. It doesn't refer only to databases. It could be like, how many servers do you have? Um, how many clusters? In which, how many locations? You know, but we are going to talk, like, talk about databases here as it is probably one of the most critical components of your application. And you might want to think about escalating databases because before you escalate servers, because they, they might not be able to take the load if you only have one process, like a database server running. And it's not the same as having backups, but we are going to see. So imagine that you have many processes hitting just one database, like, like a thousand unicorns, because, you know, that's a famous server. Uh, and then, like, that database is struggling. So what happens if the database goes offline? For any reason, it can be any reason. It can be like somebody has cut the cables on the internet. You are not secured in the cloud. The cloud is also a server somewhere in the desert, desert whatever, I don't, you know, somewhere in, I don't know where. Uh, so what happens? It might not even be your fault, you know? You might, have, you might have backups and you can restore this, but it might take you a while. It takes you a while because you need to spin up a new server. You might need to call your server central thingy, or create a new pod on the cloud, not that I know how that's done. Um, your users will go wild, your support team will drown, and you will be very stressed, and we don't want to be on that situation that probably some of you have been, you know? We don't want. So imagine there could be a better situation. You, can't, you could have many database servers running at the same time, you could have some of your processes hitting a primary database that takes all the writes, have another like database with the same, this very same information, you know, and some kind of replication that copies data from one to the other, so it's always keeping the data in sync. And, you know, what happens if the primary database goes down? Well, you know, some requests might fail. It's not a problem. And then with this setup, you also have to have um, process that it's called a failover comes into place that will like move all the requests to the other like replica database that you had and have it like as a primary database for a second, you know, for like as many minutes as like your team needs to recover the other thing. You probably have an automated recovery mechanism. I am just a backend developer, so I don't know <laughs> how that's done. So this is a very a better situation, your database might be struggling, you might be like the request may be a bit slower, but we've been there, we like that situation, it's a comfortable space for us, so no one has to worry. So that, that's like a big high level information about what does it mean, like you can make this as complicated as you want. Uh, another reason you could have multiple databases is like when you have the information sharded, shards, I don't know, uh, you partition large databases into smaller, more manageable pieces, which are called shards, and keep 
uh, instead of having one table with like a million, a hundred million color, um, rows, you can have that information split it in several databases. So you could have many, for example, users. Imagine your application has like a hundred million thousand users, whatever. And you don't want to have them in one table because it gets complicated or you want to have them in different locations, whatever the reason. But then it's like, well, your process doesn't know where to go to find it. And then you will have to use a discriminator. That's up to you. Strategies, I'm not getting into strategies. You decide your own strategy. This would be horizontal sharding, which is what Rails supports. There's also the concept of vertical one. It's like having this, the user's information split it in the, I don't know, it's, there are a lot of things on the internet, like a lot of um, blog posts. More reasons, security and compliance. Maybe your data has to be in a very secure place and you need to connect to that database for whatever the reasons. It needs to be more protected. And there can be many reasons. And here, it's like you can insert any other reason. You can make your life as complicated as you want. Um, and Rails will help you to manage this. It will help you to manage the setup. But you know what they say about early optimization is the root of all evil. Early overcomplication, it's the same. So keep in mind all the drawbacks of having the data stored in multiple databases. You cannot join the information. The transactions get more complicated, if even possible, depends on the, uh, the tool that you use, like the database. Dealing with migrations, all the replicas, all the backups, everything gets more complicated. So how do you do this? How do you, when, when it comes to high availability, because as you can see, I already told you how we use this at Harvest. The hell I know, I have no idea. Uh, this is like all done by my very smart colleagues at the site reliability team. Uh, we have many tools for that. Uh, I promise real life setup but it gets complicated. We have one primary database with six replicas. Four of them are production use. One of them is like, so we can go wild t testing things, you know, like you wanna do a, a, a big query, don't do it on your databases because you can bring that down maybe. We have a lot of information. Sometimes it can get a bit complicated. And then we have another one that I really didn't even know we had. And many tools, you know, proxy SQL for load balancing among the replicas the orchestrator for the failover situation. Uh, I put all the database related logos in there. So to make it more dramatic. So let's simplify this because I cannot explain that setup, but I can explain this one. So imagine that you have like a Rails application that connects to a primary where you can write and read, and then you have a replica that only reads. And then there's a replication with like a one second lag. Let's, let's make that up. Um, so a bit of a hist history before, um, it was introduced in Rails 6, so it's been four years, so, but still relevant because a lot of people don't know about it here. And Harvest upgraded to Rails 6.0 on June 2020. So we are in a good schedule, still not Rails 7. Um, I kept the jellyfish, it's, it was the stock image. I think it's cute. Uh, what are the features that Rails provides? You can have multiple writer databases and one replica each, manual connection switching, automatic swapping between writer and replica. We are going to really go deep into that one. Horizontal sharding and automatic shard switching since Rails 6.1 and some extra Rails tasks for migrations and so on. Uh, we'll go in, in depth. Uh, what it doesn't do for you, it won't load balance between the replicas if you have more than one. It won't decide like what replica to hit. So you have to do that yourself. There is no like replication doesn't do that. And migrations on replicas, it doesn't do that. Then you need the, all the other tools or whatever there is on the internet. How we did it before, uh, there was a gem. So Rails had like a multiple databases set up before Rails 6.0, but we had a gem we owe a lot to that gem, but nothing beats the feeling of removing a gem in favor of native support, not even a bundle update going YOLO. No, no, no. This is much better, so we could drop that. It was, it's been unmaintained since May 2017, which it can mean to things that it was very good and it was always working or that no one cared anymore. Uh, so it was, it felt great. I mean, we could not keep the gem when we migrated to Rails 6.0, but we owe a lot. I would recommend, you know, it was 
very nice to see the source code to understand how active record works and how it's done how it's done before and how it is it is done now okay show me the code we came for the code not all the explanations so i'm going to go in depth uh, in depth and uh, like on some of the features this is our database yaml configuration um, a bit simplified um, so as you can see, we use the uh, MySQL2 adapter because we, we don't use MySQL, we, we use Percona, like Percona's implementation of MySQL. Uh, I'm proud of this one, so I wanted to, you know, like we can have emojis in our database. <laughs> That's, it was a huge thing. The application is 17 years, so it took a while to migrate all the tables. It was like a fit. I could not talk about that. Then the rest of the like uh, database username is same pool as like, oh, I'm going to show the people our configuration and now how am I going to explain this? But conveniently, when I was preparing the talk, someone like Nate wrote this on Twitter. So remember that your active pool size must be equal or greater to your process level concurrency. And because we use Psychic, uh, we have that like configuration set up. So that one. Don't ask me about the two, why it's two. The plus two, it's uh, another time. And then, so this, this would be our, because we use, we have different database servers with the same data, like the same schema. So the name of the schema doesn't change. Uh, we are inheriting all the like um, configuration from the production default. We only change the host, the host. And in the case of the primary, the host is just one host. And in the case of the replica, it goes to a um, proxy that will load balance the connections. So for every unicorn, we use unicorn as our server, um, it will decide to which, um, for every time that it gets a connection, it will like send it to one of like the other replica. Cool. Once you have the configuration on the database YAML, then you can set up your application record to, well, you just tell like, What's the, what's the writing database, the primary? We called it primary on our configuration. And what's the reading database, the replica? So it's easy as that. And then how do you use the manual connection switching? So that was just like the configuration. That's, that's enough for now. So now we have to utilize what we configured. You have some blocks. You can say like, okay, I wanna, I wanna have all the connections within the block to connect to the reading database. Or if you had different and abstract um, um, application records, or as in the example, imagine you have an animals database, it has the animals record with, as an abstract class, you could decide, I only want the models that inherit from application record to connect to that, like the reading database. Um, we have the prevent rights, it's like a kind of a pro tip in my opinion. Um, so ideally, your production uh, databases, the replica, you, you will set up them in a way that do not take writes, so it's impossible to do a write, but that's going to fail on the database level, not on active record. And then for testing, you don't have the full setup. The f you, you have maybe SQLittle, SQ, SQ whatever. Um, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so, but then if you use the prevent rights, uh, you will have active record to ch check in whether like you are trying to do an insert or an update or a destroy, you know, and get an exception on your tests, which is very useful to see if like you are, you're having a controller that is doing something that you were not expecting. So we got a lot of errors thanks to that. Okay, automatic role switching and how you reduce the load of your primary database in one go. I, this, this feature made a difference for us because uh, you know your replicas are not backups that you can just fail over to if like something happens to your primary. You can use your replicas. And in our case, for example, a lot of our requests are reads on the database. So we can just like, defer those rates to like the replica databases instead of having everything, everything go into the primary. So I'm going to go with another quote. Uh, this is not me saying, so it's relatively 
primitive and on purpose. I don't know how to pronounce that word either. I tried, seriously, doesn't do a whole lot. So that's on the guides. I didn't say that, okay? Uh, you will have to tweak it. A big, like a quick overview is like, basically it says like get and head requests because it's supposed to be only selects. You go to the replica and other requests go to the writer. It's as simple as that. You know, it follows the Rails conventions, the, like the CRUD and the REST principle. So all get endpoints in my app are just doing selects, set nobody. And you can come to me, no, no, no. If you have a big enough web app, maybe an API only, maybe, but if you have a big enough web app, I'm 100%, like your get endpoints are doing some inserts or something, you know, like you had to tweak it. We also, we've seen this. We've seen a pol uh, like a search or an index like that you can send a lot of parameters and you cannot fit them all on the um, URL because it has a limit, but apparently it's, it's not in the RFC. So I wanted to tell you, this is the limit, you know, this is all lies. So we have that, we do post, like, post endpoints that are only searching things or only selects that we can send a lot of parameters. So you might have that. We have it. Another feature on this very basic automatic connection sw swiping is like uh, it prevents that uh, you don't read your own write. So what does it mean? Let's go back to this. We said that probably between your primary and your replica, there is like a replication delay. It's not as immediate. So if you have a request like this, like you are saving something, a post, and then you redirect to the post page, you want that user to be able to be retrieve what they just wrote, you know? And if the replication delay is a bit long, you won't get it. So it like the automatic connection, connection switching that Rails provides, it's uh, taking this into account. So again, it's primitive and doesn't do a whole lot. <laughs> So, but it is very, very extensible and very configurable. configurable. Uh, so we are going to see. Um, you need to create like an initializer or put everything on your application config file like some of us do. Uh, that you can like, um, let's go back. This is going to set up a middleware. So like the connection switching is going to happen on the middleware level, even, even before it reaches your controllers. So you have everything wrapped up in one database or the other, depends on your needs. So this is the middleware that it's adding. Uh, the middleware is going to use uh, just like a normal rack middleware. Um, it's going to um, surround with a block um, the, the call and it's going to here. Select the database based on the resolver. You can like tell the resolver whether it's a reading request for you, not just get and head. You can like this like do the read logic and the write logic that you want to do. So you can configure the delay because there's probably going to be some delay. You can change the resolver. And this is the default resolver. So it's like you have a uh, reading request, you have like the read. It's like choosing whether to read from the primary or the writer, depending on like whether you want to take the user to the main like primary database again, because of that read your own write. Uh, and it's going to use the context. The context um, and the write is just like a simple uh, connection switch into the writer. This is very like, what it does, what I showed you before. Um, and then the, that, this is the context. The context by default, it's the session, the user session, and sessions are in cookies, and you know what it doesn't have cookies? APIs. We don't use cookies on APIs. So this is going to work for most of application, web apps, you know, it's very basic. It just works, we use it. But if you have a big enough application, you might want to tweak it because you might want to benefit of your API like API endpoints to benefit from that. So we have um, the session. <laughs> you have all the possibilities. At Harvest, we have three apps. 
uh, three Rails app. One of them, it's an API only. A second one, it's like a web app with, inter with an internal API, and then we have the big old monolith harvest. And for each of them, we had to choose a different strategy when it comes to configuring the automatic switch in for our nets. So Forecast, like a newer app that we have, uh, it's an API only Rails app, so we could not use the session, so we are using Redis. We created a context, Redis context, that extends from the session context, and we just over uh, wrote some of the, of the methods to use Redis. Um, and the session result, like the session context is using the session, so it's like the same user is like the, the user that sends the cookie is the one that is going to get like hit the primary. We did not complicate this, so we decided like, oh, if there is a write in this account ID that we can get from the header, so we can use the middleware because that information is on the header of the request, then sure, whatever. The next one, whoever it is, is going to read from the primary. So it works for us. Um, it's fine, very easy. Our second application, Harvest ID, uh, it's like a web app with the internal um, API endpoints. The internal API endpoints are for authentication. Both Harvest app and Forecast server are using um, Harvest ID for like authentication of users and token management and all of that things. So we tweaked it a bit. We decided, you know, like always use a writer if um, the request on the path has API. We don't want to complicate this and then let leave the rest of the users have whatever the automatic switching is doing because the, the web app is not complicated. It's mostly the internal logic. It also works for us. Uh, the queries to the token, tokens database, it's not like a huge load or anything. We don't do complicated selects or anything like that. So that was fine. So what about all Harvest? Har Harvest has two public API versions, internal APIs, the web app, it's everything together. We love the monolith. Uh, but unlike Harvest ID, we wanted to benefit from uh, the, like, the automatic switching on the API endpoints. But using the middleware was not a solution for us because every API is like authenticated differently. We could not discriminate on the, on the middleware. In the middleware, you have the path, you have the headers, and that's about it. So we changed the strategy, and we created an around uh, a concern for the application controller. Uh, the concern is doing like, um, we have some kind of um, macro style methods to be able to do a thing like this, to say like, ah, oh, for, for this action, I always want to use the replica DB, or for these actions, I want to use the writer DB, you know? So like, it keeps nice and tidy. Not all the connections happening, so the connections happening before this filter are going to be connecting to the primary, but that's okay for us. It, it works fine because those queries are not complicated. And then, you know, we have this like around action to select the database and it's going to wrap up everything happening on the controller action on one of the uh, blocks that they connected to and so on. That works. The rest of things on the concern, it's probably copy and paste from the default resolver. So a lot of inspiration on that. And, you know, to end up, I have one minute. Uh, what happened after the deploy? You know, like I've seen in a lot of talks that these kind of images are very satisfying. And I have one too. <laughs> we like it. <laughs> so this is what happened when we deployed. Um, uh, the green line is like uh, my SQL questions, like queries to the primary, and the other lines were all the replicas. Very, very bored. With seamless database pool, we could do some like connection switching, and we were doing it too, but not like the whole application, you know. And okay, last thing: if you've been paying attention, I said we released that in 2020. So why am I showing you a graph from 2023? We broke it. You don't want to know how. We, broke, we changed the order of the includes in the application controller and it broke. And we did not realize for a few days, nothing happened actually, so. Uh, but now I have it because I could not get the data from 2020. So thank you. Thanks for coming to the talk. <laughs>